morning. Happy Thanksgiving weekend to you all. You guys are all here on a vacation weekend, which means you're the faithful, elect people of Christ, or you couldn't afford a vacation. Either way, we are thankful for you to be here. In 2010, I was a youth pastor in San Jose, California. Um, I was the young guy uh, driving my Chevy truck everywhere piling kids in it, going to camp, going to the wilderness, going up and down the coast, Santa Cruz. Um, Everything was done in my blue truck. I still have that truck. Um, One day I was going to church and one of my youth leaders recognized that I hitched a ride from somebody to get to church. And they said, where's the truck? And I let them know that the truck had not just a hole in the tire, but like a slashed tire, right? And so I must have like hit a curb or something, really bad. And so I I was living in San Jose, California. I was on a youth pastor's salary and I was paying rent. And San Jose, California, if you didn't know at the time, was one of the most expensive places to live. Like the rent was, uh, I wanna say $5 million, I don't know, but (laughs) it was expensive. So um, I couldn't afford to fix a truck right then and there. And so that was that. A week or two later, that same leader came to me and said, you know, I was talking to some people in, my, in the church, in our church, I told them about what's going on with your truck, and we raised, the, the tires would have cost $800, which I didn't have. They raised $1,200 for my tires, and so they gave me the money. I got some great tires for that truck. Right? It, was, it was fantastic, and so I was absolutely blessed by that as financially strapped, a young father, young husband at the time, blessed by the church. Now, have you ever been blessed with a great gift? Maybe it was your graduation, someone gave you a sump of money, a wedding, if you're you're a child, maybe it was like a quinceanera or something similar, and, and you wanted to thank the person who blessed you. Anybody been in that situation? There's many ways you can do it. One of the ways people choose is a thank you letter. Now, if I wrote a thank you letter to my church in San Jose after blessing me with new tires, How would it have gone if I said this? I want to thank you for blessing me with the money to purchase new tires, and I want you to know that it was for your benefit. The money you helped helped to give me was for you, and you're welcome. How would that have gone over? Is that the last gift I get? Yeah? And yet, here in Philippians 4... Paul says that to the Philippian church. So let's read through Philippians 4 together. We're going to go through some things together. What you do not know is you're here on a Thanksgiving weekend, but you're also here during the giving sermon, all right? And that's God's will. You're unlucky, okay? Lock the doors. They're not leaving, okay? All right. So here in Philippians 4 and starting in verse 10, Paul says this. He's going to speak from his own experience. It's like we're going to be peering in on a personal letter from him to the church. I received in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived, I'm sorry, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I'm speaking of being in need, for I've learned in whatever situation I am to be content. Very important. I know how to be brought low. I know how to abound. And in any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance, and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. And then he says this. Basically what Paul's going to say next is this. Supporting ministry is always beneficial. When you give towards the things of God, it is always good. 
Hear what he says here in 14. Yet it was kind of you to share my trouble. And you Philippians know yourselves that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, this is on his church planning mission, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving except you only. Even in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs once and again. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. I have received full payment and more. I'm well supplied, having received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent, a fragrant offering, sacrifice, acceptable and pleasing to God. And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. To God the Father, be glory forever and ever. Amen. All right. There's a lot in here, so let's dig deep. What's happening here is Paul has ended his letter to Philippians. So this is the last week of our study in, in the book of Philippians. He's telling a bit of a story of his gratefulness to the church. Anyone ever done that in a thank you letter? And so he says this, I was a missionary. I was a church planner. No other church partnered with me except for you. And he says in 15 and 16 that he appreciates the Philippian church because they supported him. And then he says this, giving is beneficial for you. The giving was beneficial for you, the church. And so the first truth we'll see out of that is giving is beneficial for the one that gives. The one that gives is the one who receives when they give. Verse 417, not that I seek the gift itself, but I seek for the profit which increases to your account. I don't need what you're giving me, but I know that when you give me, it is for your ledger, for your account. We're gonna talk about that in a second. And in 18, what you have sent is a fragrant aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. He goes into this imagery of the temple and a sacrifice. In verse 417, the word uh, account is the word logos in the Greek. Logos has a lot of meanings, but in this context, it means for your score, for your reckoning, for your account. This is for you, and it counts towards your budget, he says. L later in 2 Corinthians, he's gonna say this to the church in 2 Corinthians 9. The point is this, whoever sows sparingly will reap sparingly. Now, I know that we all know what that means because this is an agricultural society, right? No, we have no idea what that means. I know what that means because I studied the Bible for years, okay? What he's saying is he's using an illustration here. What you plant is what you will get. If you plant lots of fruit trees, you will get lots of fruit. If you plant minimal fruit trees, you will get minimal fruit. That's what he's saying. So he says this. Whoever sows sparingly will reap sparingly. Whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Now this is something for, this is important for us. We don't talk about giving a ton in here. We don't, I mean, we don't even really make a big deal of the offering because we never want it to be about money, right? And yet when the Bible talks about money, we got to talk about money, okay? So a couple things to see in here. Let's talk about biblical giving, just in case you are new here and you never understood what biblical giving is. Anyone here ever heard of tithing, a tithe? Tithe is an old Hebrew concept. It literally means one-tenth, okay? It was required as part of Moses' covenant for the people and for society to run. Okay, and there was a couple of tithes. The various tithes from Moses, like if we were going to be Old Testament, would have been about 20, 18 to 22 percent, okay, of everything. Now, here's the deal the tithe, because Moses ran the, the entirety, the government, the religion, everything, the tithe is what we call our taxes today, okay? And it's about the same. Our tax, we're taxed at about 20 percent of our income, right? Helps streets and everything run. When Jesus established a new covenant with his people, the Old Testament requirement was done away with. And the new requirement was not 
but generous giving. That's what he says in 2 Corinthians. And so generous giving means 10% is the beginning. And we've always said here, it's the low bar. Okay? Now, when, so when we hear tithe, it doesn't necessarily mean tenth. It's just like, you guys ever heard the word quiet time or the phrase quiet time? What's quiet time mean? As, a, as, as it pertains to your Bible study, what's quiet time mean? Okay. Wow. Everybody needs to study the Bible in the morning, okay? <laughs> quiet time usually means I wake up, I read the Bible before I do anything else, right? That's what quiet time usually means, okay? But here's the thing. Quiet time isn't always quiet. Sometimes quiet time is loud because you're singing along to a worship song, right? Sometimes quiet time is loud because you're crying to God, correct? But we call it quiet time because everybody knows that's the time we study our personal study time with the, word, with the Lord. So when we say tithing, we just mean you're giving, okay? Know that. That's the term for giving. Now, what should be required of a New Testament Christian to give. All it says in 2 Corinthians 9, give as you've decided in your heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion. Like I'm calling you up, where's your tithe, right? First of all, I don't even know who gives what, okay? There are a few people in the church who knows what give, who gives what. It's not me, it's not any of the staff, okay? So we don't know. You're not under compulsion, you're not forced, but you're a cheerful giver. This is what the truth is about giving, okay? The truth is about giving is this. When you give generously, it is an investment into God's kingdom. When you give generously, it's an investment into the eternal. Do you guys hear that? Okay, and so here are three ways that I've just... I've gleaned from people who give, okay, where that investment shows off. If 2 Corinthians 9 is Paul, God's word, God's speaking through Paul saying, if you give little, you will get little. If you give a lot, you will get a lot. And me, being a sound theologian, as sound as I could be in 2020, I think I'm pretty sound, right? And not trying to steal your um, benefits, right? Not trying to steal your money. I believe that that means that when you give, you get from, from the Lord. I believe that. Like, there's no other way to translate around that. And yet, this is not a health and wealth gospel. What it means is when you invest into eternity, there are a couple of ways it pays off. Number one, and this, I've seen this, financial blessings. Like, that's not me putting up a front. I've seen it. People have been blessed through business or some other form. They, they go, wow, I'm so blessed. Thank you, God. And they give a generous amount towards a church or the church, and then you know what God does? Gives them more, like more. And they go, I don't know what to do with all this money. How many of you would love that problem, first of all, right? Right? But he knows that those people, what do they do with that money? They give, right? They continue to give. And so one of the ways that God blesses is financial slash material blessing. That's not guaranteed, but that's one of the ways, okay? Most of the time, it's those people who give, and they've understood some things I'm gonna talk about later, and then they get more and then they give more, okay? The second way that it pays off, like this is never, when you give to the Lord, it's never void. It always accounts for something. The second way is spiritual blessing, okay? There are people who live amongst you who don't have as much material goods, and yet, spiritually, they're blessed. Like, they feel the presence of the Lord, right? They, 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 they feel close to God. Like, there is an immense blessing that goes beyond the material, okay? All right? And so, that could be another way, when you invest in the kingdom, that that shows off. The, the third way, maybe it doesn't show up financially. Maybe even spiritually, it's hard. Like, God is allowed and ordained, and there's reasons for that. But the third way, and because this never comes vo back void, is heavenly blessing. Jesus himself said, store it in heaven where it can't rust, where it can't be eaten by moths, can't be destroyed. And so 
It's just like those of you who give towards your retirement, but even your retirement's kind of shaky, like you could lose it if the market drops. This is a heavenly investment that will pay off for you upon death in the, earth, in the heavenly kingdom, right? So, so what God says here, as far as giving goes, honestly, not health and wealth stuff, is the more you give, the more you're blessed, okay? So be a generous giver, Question is, do you believe it? Okay. So some ways that giving benefits the giver, and this is the stuff that I was going to talk about later, the spiritual blessing. Number one, it shows spiritual maturity in you. I'll tell you this. Our church has been through a lot since the pandemic, right? Coming out and opening up doors. I will tell you that our church is growing. It's larger than it's been in a while, Right? And yet this year, our budget's got to go down, right? We know that. We've had to make cuts. Why is that? Well, the reason is we've got new believers, right? We got new people who don't necessarily understand giving and how that works and stuff like that. Okay. Like, that's what we're here for. Let's work together. But giving shows spiritual maturity in you. When you give, it's beneficial for you spiritually because it shows that the love of money doesn't consume you. Paul said this to Timothy. The love of money is the root of all sorts of evil, and some by longing for it have wandered away from the faith and, perce- and pierced themselves with many griefs. How many of you have ever read that and said money is the root of all evil? How many of you have ever read that? But money's not the root of all evil. What's the root of all evil? It's a heart thing. And so we get to the bottom of this. Giving is a heart thing. And so God, through this discipline of giving, wants to know, what do you love? What do you love? This world we live in, we live in, teaches us to love money. It teaches us to value the wealthy, right? In our society, in popular society, there are wealthy dum-dums, okay? Just bricks, right? No thoughts, no original thoughts, okay? Right? And yet, we value them as though they've accomplished something, don't we? That's been going on since the beginning of time. And so we value money. And God is saying here, what do you value? Matthew 6 said this, no one can serve two masters for either he will hate the one and love the other or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. And you go, oh, he must be talking about like heaven and hell, like Satan. But he says right here, you cannot serve God in wealth. Oh, he's, he's gonna make that very clear for me, <laughs> right? right? And so... And like I said, I've known wealthy Christians who have been sound in their faith because they didn't love the money. And yet for all of us, he's teaching us the pursuit of wealth could be a deficit in our heart and the lack of giving could be a deficit in our heart. So when we give, when we make a commitment to give, it shows there's spiritual maturity in you. It's like this. Anyone in here give blood? Anyone in here it's easy to give blood? Anyone in here it's hard to give blood? Like the side of a needle makes you pass out. Like you get to punching nurses and stuff and like they got to restrain, right? Okay, so giving blood is not easy, okay? Thank God for modern medicine. It's kind, of, it's kind of been streamlined into easy, but they're putting a needle in you and they're withdrawing something that you need to live and it's going to someone else who needs it, right? But it takes a maturity on your part to say, I will give of myself so that that person who needs it can get, Right? It takes a maturity. It's the same. It's the same with giving. Like, this is my finances. I worked hard for this. And you got to draw it out of and, and give it to. It takes a maturity to do that. In your Christian walk, there will be indicators all the time. I'm going to take a drink of this, I promise. I'm not just going to hold it around like, uh, okay, hold on. Okay, there. Sorry. In the Christian walk, there will be indicators all the time of your faith. Like I said, I've been a youth pastor. I was a youth pastor for 15 years. Been in this role for five years now. It's, time flies, right? And I've had students, I've had adults come up to me and go, how do I know if I'm saved? Is that a legitimate question? Absolutely. You're asking the tough questions. Good. I will sit down with them and we'll kind of do an audit of their life and I'll look for indicators of faith. Giving is one of them. Do you love God or do you love money? 
Because if you love money more than God, maybe that's an indicator that your heart isn't really God's. but I'm not trying to sell you a timeshare, all right? That's not what's happening right now. It's good when you give to God. If you think that North Orange is being self-serving, when we say that, then here's a challenge that we've always had. Write your check, put it in the offering, and write it to another local church. I'm serious, we'll deliver it. I got friends in churches in Fullerton, Orange, Anaheim, Garden Grove. I got friends in churches all over the place. I'll tell you what churches to write them to. But I guarantee you, if you give, you will get blessed. That is the guarantee from the Lord. All right? So this isn't just about us. But with that being said, we're not going to be fools here. The truth is, when you give, it helps somebody. I mean, we got a budget. That's why the next point Paul says here is, giving is good for the recipient. That's why we take tithes and offerings. Like, hey, let's meet that budget, right? Let's, let's, let's do what needs to be done. When you give towards a missionary in Indonesia, then his kids can get their cavities filled. You, you understand what I'm talking about? Like, giving helps somebody else. 418 again. I have received everything in full and have an abundance. I am amply supplied. Paul says, I have everything I need from you. So when you give, the person who receives also is blessed. Have you ever had your needs met before when you didn't know how you were going to have them met? That's a blessing, isn't it? Right. And Paul's saying, you came through for me. Nobody else came through. You guys did. That's a blessing. Maybe you've been down on your luck like Paul, or you lived in Orange County and your rent, I don't know, is it $5 million here yet? Right? It's a catch up with San Jose. You've been blessed. The person who receives is blessed. I myself have been blessed by people in this room and people around the world, like when I was in need. So when you give, it's good for the recipient. We have the church budget. How does the budget get fulfilled? It's a projection of what we think it's going to look like, what it's going to look like in the coming year. And like I said, we're growing. Which means more ministries, by the way. Like, I gotta find more people to hire to fill all these people, because we're growing, which is good. And yet, our budget had to go down. So we gotta do more with less. And so, giving, no brainer, helps the budget. And there's so much, so much growth here, so many programs we're gonna start, right? So, giving meets that. And I guess the application I have to ask myself right about now is you need to ask, do I give? You need to ask, do I bless others? You need to ask, do I shoulder the burden? And if you don't do that, you need to ask yourself why. 
Is greed, distrust, or any other thing corrupting my Christian walk? Is overspending corrupting my Christian walk? And now I'll say this here, just in case you were shamed at another church or heard some, some, some other pastor say you need to give no matter what. I don't want you to go bankrupt giving to this church, okay? If you got like mortgage payments, student loan payments, car payments, baby formula, and like, but I gotta give to God first, right? Like, I, I couldn't feel good about that, right? But here's what, what I am saying. Some of you have the ability to be generous. Like you've been gifted, you've inherited like homes from family and stuff and God's been good and blessed you in your workplace and you have the ability to give. And that's the people that need to give more. And if you're spending too much, if you're you know, in debt, get out of debt so that you can bless and give, okay? All right, that's the first part. You guys haven't walked away, we're still friends? Okay, let me know we're still friends. Put a $5 in my po- pocket later, I'm just kidding. <laughs> that's, that's a charlatan, all right? All right. And then Paul moves on, and he says something that's really important, and it's important for us, especially in these days. He says this, God is good enough for you in the good and the bad times. How many of you have been through good times? How many of you have been through bad times? Okay, I'm glad that God is enough in the good and the bad times, because those are the only times I have, right? Right? Correct? So God is good. We read this already. We're going to read it again. Not that I speak from want, for I've learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. I know how to get along with humble means, and I also know how to live in prosperity. And in every circumstance, I have learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both of having abundance and suffering need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. We've heard that scripture before. What Paul is saying is he's showing us the contrasting um, portions of life. He's lived them both. I've had no bread, like I'm starving, and I've had plenty of food. I've lived in abundance, prosperity, like a young, uh, like temple law, lawyer, like living good Pharisee, and I've been broke and naked, like full on, I don't even have enough clothes, right? And he says, through all of them, God has been enough. God is enough in the good times, correct? We don't have to like preach that, right? God is enough in the good times. My question is, do we forget about God in the good times? What do you do when you get what you've been praying for? Do you forget about God? Do you forget about the worship service? Do you forget about the fellowship and the commitment you, you set aside with other Christians? So that's a thing to think about, okay? God is the God of good times. Most of the time, this is the truth we need to hear. God is enough in the bad times. How many people need to hear that? Lest you think I'm speaking about somebody who doesn't know what he's talking about, I want to read to you from Paul and the things he went through to say God is enough in the bad times. This is from 2 Corinthians. He gives a list. Five times I received at the hands of the Jews 40 lashes less one. What that is is a whip. And according to the guidelines, 40 would kill you. So you know how they didn't kill you? They hit you with 39 lashes. Five times he got those. Three times I was beaten with rods. Those are sticks. That was a Roman punishment when they couldn't kill you. Once, Paul says, I was stoned. And this isn't your Grateful Dead stoned, okay? What he's saying is there was a mob that came trying to kill me. And what they do is they take him outside of the city so that he's outside of city laws and and then they throw rocks at you until you stop twitching. It's a murder. And it still happens to this day around the world. He says, once they did that, and you know what happened? I didn't die. Probably wishes he died, right? Like, that's not a fun day. Three times I was shipwrecked. These are people who the major mode of transportation is ships. Like, they don't have planes yet. And so once is enough, right? So I seen castaway. Once is enough, Right? Three times shipwrecked. One night and a day I have spent in the deep. So one of those times he was shipwrecked, he was just floating. Jack and Rose Titanic floating. Okay? This is not fun. 
on frequent journeys in danger from rivers, like trying to cross rivers and streams to share the gospel, danger from robbers, it's likely that Paul was often attacked and robbed, danger from my own people, so Paul says the Jews attacked him at least 11 times in the book of Acts, and then he goes, dangers from the Gentiles, that's all people. Three times he was attacked by the Gentiles in the book of Acts, so he's Always in danger from his people. Danger in the city, if I'm going to go plant in the city, like there are people there who could rob me. Danger in the wilderness from weather, wild animals, hunger, lack of shelter. Danger on the sea, we already talked about that. Danger from false brothers. I mean, that betrayed, right? In toil and hardship, through many a sleepless night, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. And Paul lists this laundry list of the things that he has endured for the gospel. In Philippians 4.13, he says this, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. What he is teaching us right now is this, resilience. Resilience. I often talk about, like, I... Just watch where the culture is going and where Christianity is going. I believe that one of the demonic tactics Satan has for the church to hamstring you, to handicap you, to make you crippled spiritually is this, to take away your resilience. Philippians 4.13 is not like I could jump off a cliff and I can fly. I could do all things to him who's strengthening me, right? Like you're going to fall, that's going to hurt, Right? Philippians 4.13 is, when the times get tough, I'm going to be okay. Resiliency. Why? I almost didn't drink from that again. Why? Okay. Paul has figured something out. What is the biggest problem in life that you will face? What's the biggest problem in life that you'll face? Think about it. You don't have to yell it out. Is it homelessness? Is it joblessness? Is it losing a loved one? The biggest problem in life that you will face is paying for your sins. Every sin that you've committed, every sin that you've committed by not committing, right? Like the things I was supposed to do, I didn't do. There needs to be an accountability for. There needs to be a a, a discipline, a, a, a judgment for. And so you are carrying the weight of your own sins. And yet, if you are in Jesus Christ, what happens to the weight of your own sins? What happens? You guys can talk to me for this one. What happens if you're in Jesus Christ to your sins? They're wiped away. So Paul says, the biggest problem I have had is sin, and Jesus has paid for my sin. Everything else, I'm going to be all right, as long as I got God. As a young Pharisee, maybe he read through Psalm 73, which says this, whom have I in heaven but you? There's nothing on earth that I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. If I have God, I'm going to be okay. I can do all three, all things through God. If I lose God, I'm in trouble, right? But if I have God, I'm going to be okay. I can get through it. He's teaching us resiliency, which is something you need. Because if you don't have resiliency, you'll crumble under life's pressures. If you don't have resiliency, you might walk away from the faith. Get it. Get it from the scripture. And the next thing he's teaching us is contentment. I don't need everything. I've got God. God in his goodness has blessed me with this. I don't need all that. I know what it's like to have a lot, what it's like to have a little. Whatever I have, I have God. Are my sins paid for? Hallelujah, it's a good day. Amen? And let me say this to you. Contentment is not settling. We live in a society that's never satisfied. Can't be content. You're settling, right? You gotta have more, more, more. Contentment is being satisfied with God Himself. Contentment is not Plan B when everything else falls apart. Contentment is knowing who God is, what God has done for you, and trusting in that. The whole Christian experience is about you and God. Don't think that when you lose all your earthly possessions, God has abandoned you. 
You still have the most important part of your Christian walk. You have God. Horatio Spafford was a lawyer and successful businessman. He was an elder in his church. He was a family man, married with a son and four daughters. Having invested in real estate on the coast of Lake Michigan, he had amassed a fortune. He was rich. The great Chicago fire of 1871 wiped out his entire fortune overnight. Shortly after that, his only son, two years old, died of scarlet fever. Grieving, Horatio decides, my family needs a vacation. They were gonna go to Europe, to England. His friend D.L. Moody was preaching. So he sent his wife and his four daughters ahead of him. He, he, he had some business to take care of. You guys get a couple of extra days of vacation. His wife and daughters are on their transatlantic trip headed to England and their ship crashes into another ship. His four daughters drown in the Atlantic. His wife, grieving, heartbroken, sends a telegram home that reads, saved alone. So now Horatio has to take the same voyage to meet his grieving wife in England. And as his ship passes over the portion of the ocean where his four daughters drowned, he goes down into his room and he writes these words. When sorrows like sea billows roll, it is well, it is well with my soul. My sin, oh the bliss of this glorious thought, my sin, not in part but the whole, is nailed to the cross and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul. If you aren't aware, that's the hymn, It Is Well With My Soul. And that is the earth-shattering circumstances under which that beloved hymn was written. The heartbroken, grieving hand who wrote it didn't write it under compulsion. He didn't write it because he was forced. He wrote it because even though he lost everything, everything, he was convinced God is enough. What about you? Is God enough for you? When the bank forecloses, when your business burns to the ground, when the doctor comes back with a terminal diagnosis, is God enough for you? I pray that he is. I pray that we can learn from Horatio's story this morning. I pray that we can learn from Paul's story. God is enough in the good and the bad times. Let's pray. Dear God, you have so much for us to learn. And yet at the core of them is our absolute necessity of you. And so God, would you instill in us a truth, a, a trust that you are good enough for us. And in that trust, God, would you give us the courage to generously give. And to those who generously give, Lord, I'm asking you to bless them. And for us here this morning, as we look at our budget and how we're going to meet it, God, I pray that you would exceed it. Let's do way more ministry here in Orange County, God. For anybody here who is experiencing the bad time of this morning, God, I pray that you would meet them with your grace. Contentment is a hard thing for us to learn, but it's necessary for the Christian. So would you shore up in us that foundational truth that when we have you, we have enough. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen.